So hello everyone. I guess you can see my screen. So just we're gonna wait a couple of minutes until um, everyone else joins us. Um, you can see I have created a nice first slide so that I try kind of to capture different areas of interest within the university and, and within my own profile, which is augmented by um, the MSc of AI program that we are running here. Um, so I think today primarily we're gonna focus on um, just going back to some basic things on uh, on data science and, and then going to focus more on the machine learning and deep learning aspect, right? Um, of course, it's quite important uh, before we go on to the more advanced concepts like, you know, deep learning algorithms. It's quite important to just, uh, you know, understand how um, the whole concept of, of machine learning works, right? So, so bear with me, we're going to go through all of these aspects uh, shortly. Um, but yeah, myself, I uh, am currently uh, an associate professor with the University of, of Aberdeen. I'm uh, also the director of, of the MSC AI program, and all of this is, is part of our Department of Computing Science. Um, so of course, um, you know, I, I'm going to speak about the university itself. Maybe we can um, discuss about what it's on offer in this program, and then we're going to go through uh, the specifics of, of today's talks. Of course, University of Aberdeen, we have a long history of, of AI research, right? So we rank in the, in the world top 100 universities. Uh, Computer Science Department has uh, recently been ranked within the, the five best uh, departments in, in the UK. And uh, as, as you know, we are a research intensive university um, based on the previous uh, research excellence framework exercise. Uh, currently, we have quite a few um, AI research projects. Um, that are funded by different uh, funders, for instance, UKRI, uh, EU Horizon 2020. And all of these projects, of course, they have a, a solid theoretical uh, component, but also they are focusing on different application areas, right? Uh, and that's quite important. So within the program, um, the MSc that we're discussing today, um, to some extent, we are covering different topics, right? Some of these topics concern um, some foundations of AI. So we go back to the basics of what AI is, how we, we define intelligence. We have some probabilistic models and some Bayesian approaches that we discuss about. And then of course we have other aspects that relate more to machine learning, applied AI, natural language generation and so on. Um, so today I thought that uh, it's gonna be a good opportunity to maybe introduce some basic concepts on, on machine learning and deep learning. And then we're gonna see some uh, examples, some, some case studies, but before that, um, you can see my details um, on, on the right hand side of, of your screen. These are some links that, that you can follow. These are my details. Please feel free to contact me if you would like to ask anything uh, afterward. If you come up with any question or if you are interested in, in any aspects of my research, I'm very happy to discuss with you um, one to one. So um, I would say that myself, uh, I have an equal interest between uh, the theory in machine learning and also application, right? So within the the scope of machine learning, I'm I'm very much interested in deep learning theory, and um, I have a few PhD students and projects related to capsule networks, which are a specific type of, of neural network. We're going to see later on uh, domain adaptation, which uh, uh, concerns the transfer knowledge from one domain to the other and self-supervised learning, which is a paradigm of learning that concerns the uh, development of some pretext tasks that we can augment the learning process of, of an intelligent system, right? Um, I would say that from an application perspective, I have a strong interest in agri-food, so I have been involved in different projects about yield forecasting and, and optimizing uh, greenhouses. But at the same time, I have some projects related to nuclear reactors, uh, medical imaging and environmental data imputation. Uh, so broadly speaking, this is what we're going to um, discuss in, in details later on. Um, here you can see the contents of, of today's uh, talk. Uh, I think we are going to, you know, after introducing some basic concepts so that you have, uh, you know, established your common knowledge in terms of uh, background knowledge, then we're going to see two different case studies. One on a medical imaging problem um, and the other on nuclear reactor anomaly detection. And then we can have you know, some interaction. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, and then we can have a bit more 
um, you know, um, elaborate discussion on these issues. So I think it's important for, for, for people that haven't been involved in any machine learning research to kind of introduce what machine learning actually is. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, depends on <laughs> from which side you, you, you see that, uh, you will not find, you will not find a very well defined definition of machine learning, right? So you can see different people define machine learning in different words or focus on different areas of, of, uh, of machine learning when they want to describe uh, the term. But broadly speaking, machine learning refers to uh, the scientific field that concerns the development of algorithms and different types of models that we can extract knowledge from different types of data. We can identify patterns, we can identify interactions um, and make some decisions with uh, you know, minimal human intervention, right? Uh, of course, we have to take into account the fact that uh, we are discussing about a very high dimensional space. So that is uh, something that sometimes when we are discussing with uh, some layman audience, uh, it's hard to grasp. So, you know, we are used to think at a small scale. So we have, for instance, you know, we wanted to describe a system and we have five different variables that we measure. And then we kind of try to reason as humans as to which variables maybe are more influential in the decision making process. But usually when we, when we speak about machine learning, we scale things up. So we speak at, at a very high dimensional space. So we might have, for instance, uh, uh, millions of images or video files or cloud points and, and so on. So as you can imagine, uh, for a human to be able to extract knowledge from such a, a huge space, it's not possible. That's why we employ machine learning models that they can not only automate the process, but also be powerful enough to scale things up, right? Um, another important aspect with machine learning is that we do not have to limit ourselves to specific type of data. So we can combine different data sources, um, not only in a unimodal way, which unimodal in this case means that we are using only one modality, for instance, images, but we can scale it up in a multimodal manner. So for instance, we might have a problem um, that we are collecting images and at the same time we have uh, sensor data, right? Time series. We can combine both sources and then using information from both types of data, then we can train a model on top of that so that we extract knowledge and, you know, develop something that's more accurate, more, more precise, right? So from now on, when we speak about machine learning or deep learning, you should not kind of associate that with, let's say, only images, right? It can be any sort of data that we can extract information from, right? Of course, machine learning, um, it's, you know, it's a very high level definition. Then we have deep learning, which, you know, focuses more on, on the neural networks, which is more uh, the focus of, of today's uh, lecture. But again, before we go to that level, we need to kind of clarify in our minds what learning is, right? And in the machine learning context, we have um, three different types of learning. The most common one is the self, is a supervised learning, the one that, that you see here. In the supervised uh, context, we have uh, data, right, that we are collecting. But at the same time, we have the corresponding annotations of the data. So for instance, if we have an image, we know that this image shows a dog, so we label this image as, as a dog. So then if we have a learning algorithm, it can try to identify what features within the image correspond to a dog. And then you might have images of a cat or other types of, of animals, right? Uh, of course, when we speak about uh, supervised learning, you should think that both regression and classification are part of this context. So we might have, um, you know, continuous data, which means numbers like 0 0.5, 0 0.7, uh, and then we have, uh, you know, a point where we are predicting a number. So that is a regression concept. Whereas in the classification, we have labels, like we, we have dog, cat, elephant, right? We don't need uh, to have a number for that. That, that differentiates between regression and classification in that context. And of course, in the figure that you see on, on the right hand side, uh, this is a problem um, that corresponds to, you know, uh, solving and detecting different flowers. Uh, and you can see, for instance, that we have the sepal length and the sepal width here. Uh, and of course, the different colors that we have one, two, three, 
here, for instance, corresponds to different classes. So in this case, we would have three different flowers. And all of the data points that you see in this area correspond to, to data that we have collected about the different types of flowers, right? So that concept is, is the, the, the supervised learning. Uh, sometimes in, in real life applications, we might have an abundance of uh, data that are not annotated. So for instance, we might have, uh, you know, environmental data that we don't have a corresponding label. So, you know, we, we know that this data exists, but um, either it's very laborious to annotate them or we cannot annotate them because it might be a retrospective uh, process. But at the same time, uh, we might have some data. So, you know, a smaller sample of data that um, we have the labels for, right? So let's say that we have 1 million data that are not annotated and 1,000 data that they are annotated. So in this context, when we combine these two different uh, types of, uh, of, of data paradigms, we have a semi-supervised learning case. Um, so of course, there are different techniques that can be used uh, to kind of extract uh, knowledge from uh, these two different types of, uh, of learning paradigms. Um, but actually, to be honest, in, in real life applications, we are focusing uh, mostly on the two extremes, which is the supervised or the unsupervised uh, context. So in the unsupervised context, uh, actually it is what we said previously. So uh, we don't have any, any, any annotations at all. So in that case, we are collecting data. For instance, let's say that we have images, uh, but we don't have um, the labels uh, for instance, that you know a specific image is a dog or it's a cat or it's an elephant, uh, but we have the images, right? So in this case, in the unsupervised way of, of learning, we are trying to find what features we have within its image so that we say, you know what? I might not know that this image corresponds to a dog, but trust me that I understand that, you know, an image that shows an elephant uh, versus an image that shows a cat, they'll be different, right? So I cannot tell you that this is a cat or an elephant, but I can tell you that this image is different than this one, okay? So that is the context of unsupervised learning. And of course, uh, on, on the right lower side of, of your screens, you can see a plot, which in this case, it's a plot, uh, as you will see, it's a three-dimensional plot. Um, and then we have different clusters. So that's why when we speak about unsupervised learning, uh, you have to get used to the concept of clusters because you will find um, some sort of, uh, you know, other type of um, uh, of uh, books or, or lectures that they will, you know, specifically mention this concept as clustering. And there are some famous algorithms uh, that they do clustering. For instance, there is um, k-means, which is one of the most famous ones. Um, that kind of, if you plot the clusters, you will see something like, you know, the image here, right, in this one. So this is actually um, a plot that has been created uh, after the k-means uh, approach has been applied to this type of, of data. So you can plot the clusters and then understand whether, you know, the process has been successful, okay? So broadly speaking, this is the, the concept of, of learning. Um, we touched upon that in, in a previous slide, right, when we spoke about the supervised learning, uh, but I still find it quite common that some people, you know, confuse um, what is a regression and what is classification, right? Um, if we put it in a simplistic way, classification is, is when um, we are trying to find within, let's say, the space that we have available, so the data that we have available, we're trying to find what patterns exist that we can use to classify something. As we said before, I find that, you know, a dog has, you know, bigger nose or whatever uh, than a cat. And then you say this is an important feature that differentiates between uh, dogs and cats or other types of uh, attributes. Um, but still, that is information that you have within uh, the image. And that is important for a learning algorithm to use uh, to enhance the learning process, right? But when we go to the regression, um, then we have um, you know, as we said before, a continuous uh, output, which is a number, kind of 1.1, 1.5, 500, whatever, right? But for, for a learning algorithm to be effective, it has to, to understand what is the 
generation mechanism that is underlying uh, you know the development of this approach because that is the way of optimizing uh, you know the, the performance uh, of, uh, of of the regression algorithm that we are developing, right? So it's not only about whether classification you have uh, you know classes one to three classes, and and regression you have just a continuous number as an output, is is fundamentally how the principles so the mathematics of of the techniques actually you know work with. Um, so. It's quite common when we speak about machine learning and deep learning to, um, you know, to consider them to be as a black box approach. And black box approach means that, you know, we have an input, we get an output, but what happens between, uh, in between that aspect, it's a bit less clear. And that is true to some extent, right? So some of these approaches are working very well in practice, but when we dissect and try to understand, you know, why do they work very well? Uh, or can I uh, interpret the output, or is there kind of a clear pathway of how you can, you know, go from one way to the other? So, what is the pathway that you've reached, so that you say, you know, what the output is this because of this has happened in the in the input? So that is a, a whole field of research in deep learning, as I learning, so that we we try to make the black box to be a bit more, you know, transparent in that concept, right? So, let's go on to the today's focus. So, so deep learning, as I mentioned before. Is a is a subtopic of um, of machine learning. Um, it has become quite popular in the last decade, and one reason for that has been the uh, actually the availability of, of more powerful computational uh, resources. And it's quite common when we are uh, developing deep learning algorithms to be uh, using uh, GPU cards, which are more powerful than the CPU um, uh, processing units. Which in this case, you know, it means that we can um, maybe speed up the operations by 20, 30 times sometimes, right? Um, so here you can see um, a neural network, which is artificial neural network, which is different from the biological neural network, and that is the um, the main component of uh, a deep learning algorithm, right? So um, so here we can see three different layers, right? So we have the input layer, so you can see here, which is actually the, the layer that accepts an input from the outside world. For instance, if we have images, you know, image uh, it kind of uh, constitutes different pixels, so we have multiple pixels within the image, and then each pixel becomes an input. And in this context, we have the input layer at the very first stage of the neural network. So then when we have the input like that, then actually we have to start this learning extraction process where we extract information from the input to then use it for detecting something, right? So before we go to the to, to, to this kind of intermediate step, let's go direct to the output. So let's go here. The output is, is this part of, of the network. So as we saw before, we have input and output, and the black box happens in between this process. So for us, in this context, the black box would be the, the hidden layer. So the hidden layer is this part of, of the network here. So the orange nodes. And that is the, 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 the point in the network that we extract uh, all of these kind of um, you know, important patterns and characteristics that can be used for you know, detecting something. Before we said about dogs and cats, so in this case, the input would be the images, but the hidden layers are, will be responsible for extracting all of these characteristics of dogs and cats that differentiate one from the other, right? So then when we move from the hidden layer onto the output layer, so the part here, which is the blue part, the blue dots that, that you see here, we have one, two, three, four. So in this context, it means that we have four classes, right? And four classes in that case, would be, for instance, if we had four different animals, dogs, cats, elephants, and leopard, for instance, right? So in this case, we would know that the input will have examples of uh, these four animals, and then the hidden layer will extract all of these you know, characteristics that differentiate between the different animals, and then in the output, we will say, you know what, you gave me 
an image of, of a leopard. So here, you know, I can be confident that this image corresponds to um, you know, a leopard, right? Or if it's a cat, then it's a cat. Um, so yeah, so that is the, the broader concept of neural networks, right? But of course, here you can see a very simplistic example. Uh, so in this example, we have two hidden layers. So you can imagine hidden layers as the means of making models more complex, right? So, so in practice, uh, when we design neural networks, we can go either uh, horizontally like that. So we might have, let's say, 10 layers, right? But we can also go vertically. So we can go like that. So which, which means that we have more units. So these circles that, that you see here, they are called uh, units or neurons or nodes. So you can find different ways of, uh, of referring to them. So when we make more complex models, we will um, increase the number of layers, but at the same time, we might increase the number of, uh, of, of hidden uh, nodes, right? So in practice, in, uh, you know, in real life applications, you might have you know, 10, 20, 30 hidden layers, and you might have, let's say, 500 um, neurons in that case. So that, that is quite a realistic example. And of course, that scales with the problem. So some problems are, are much more uh, complex than others. So, you know, so sometimes um, we, you know, we want to make some experiments to understand uh, in the specific application that we are dealing with. Uh, how complex we need to have, uh, you know, a model in that case. Um, so I think another very important concept on neural networks is how actually we can visualize, uh, you know, the different complexities of, of the model, right? So here you can see in, in these uh, three images that, for instance, if you go on to the first one here, we have a very simple uh, structure. So we have one hidden layer and one neuron. I mean, if you recall in the previous example, that is already, you know, a quite complex model based on what we are describing here, right? Um, so in one hidden layer and one neuron, as, as you see, we have two different classes. One class, you can see, you know, examples are here, and in the second class, we have the examples here. But of course, you see that the way that the different data points, which in this case, we can think of these data points, as being two different classes. So again, let's say that the orange dots, so that the dots here correspond to um, characteristics of cats, right? Whereas the blue ones in the middle, let's say that they are characteristics of dogs. But you can see with one hidden layer and one neuron, um, we cannot actually, you know, split the data in a way where we say, okay, this is my, my class one and this is my class two. So we need something more complex to that one. So then if we add a second neuron, right, you see that again, the shape of, uh, you know, of how we can differentiate between the different classes changes, right? So this is a visualization of, of the learning process. So you see that still, I'm able to kind of identify some of them correctly, but then I am missing out here because in this case, then I will be classifying all of these points as being one class, which is obviously wrong, right? So this cannot be the case. So if, for instance, um, the blue ones here are class one and this one are class two, then the algorithm will say that everything is class one. And obviously that's wrong. So again, we need something more complex than that. So then if we go to the third one, where we have three neurons, you see now suddenly all the pieces um, have started coming together, right? So then you see that, hmm, okay, I've made my model more complex. So yeah, it seems that the way that we have uh, defined our model, uh, I'm almost successful to um, creating a model that can actually, you know, differentiate properly between the two different classes. Uh, and of course, when we are arriving at that point of, um, of precision, then what is quite important is these binaries, right? So actually what we want to achieve is be able to generalize. And when we speak about generalization, it means that when I'm developing a model like that, 
then I am able when I have new data. So let's say I go outside in my garden, I see a cat and I take a photo of a cat. Then if I import this image to my model, my model should be able still to say, you know, this is a cat. So my model should not be expecting to get very similar images to the ones we've used to train the model. So recall, when we speak about training a model, you can think of, uh, you know, I have three children, right? So as part of my day-to-day -day, uh, interaction with my children is to teach them something. Um, you know, they learn even animals, right? You know, I showed my daughter, you know, a book, this is a cat, and then I'm expecting her to be able then if she sees a cat outside, to say, you know, that, that's that's a cat, right? So similarly, you have to teach the, you know, the machine learning algorithms that, you know, this image is, is a cat. Of course, you know, it's artificial intelligence in that, in that context, so we cannot compete with humans. We have totally different way of reasoning. So it, it's not uh, uh, the similar concepts that are used uh, when we extract knowledge ourselves as humans versus uh, a model. But you can think of that in a simplistic way that, that still we have to have examples um, to be able to train something uh, effectively, right? So a very common pipeline of deep learning is, is what you see actually here. So we have, uh, you know, the, the very first architecture that we're developing. So we put together different uh, parts of, of the architecture. Then we have actually the input here. You see dogs and cats. So then we move on to, you know, actually training this architecture with real data. So then we are confident that we are developing a model that can differentiate between, you know, uh, the different types of input. And of course, it's very important, especially when we speak about applications of deep learning, to think not only from the training perspective, but okay, you know, I've trained a model, how can I use a model in real life? So then you move on to inference. So in the inference phase, you have a trained model, you see, that is trained now. I don't touch it again. I've developed it, I've validated that, and then that has been deployed, right? So then we are using this trained model. Um, and then if we have new data as input, we are getting uh, a corresponding output, right? So that, that is a pipeline of how we are developing deep learning in, in real life. So deep learning um, has been one of the most successful machine learning uh, approaches in the last decade or so. But of course, there are other approaches, for instance, decision trees, logistic regression, or support for machines. Uh, so these are different uh, learning algorithms. Um, and here in this plot, you can see um, how deep learning um, you know, corresponds to or compares against uh, other learning uh, algorithms, right? So we have almost um, a linear improvement in performance um, with the uh, additional amounts of, of data. So the more data that we have, the better performance we, we get, right? And that is one of the main advantages. So if we have lots of data, then we know that the deep learning models can, can scale. So they are very powerful in, in, in extracting uh, different abstractions within the data and high level abstractions. Side. So we start from the very simple, um, you know, characteristics onto more complex ones. So deep learning models are very um, successful in that aspect. Uh, for instance, uh, if, if you see my face now, right? So if my face goes through, you know, uh, you know, into a, um, a deep learning model, then in the first layers, for instance, the first hidden layer, we'll be trying to, to understand, you know, very simple concepts like, you know, uh, some edges or some curves on the face. And then as you move on to subsequent layers, like second, third, fourth, 100th hidden layer, then we start putting all of these things together and creating shapes, you know, or colors or textures. So we make things more complex as we, you know, add more layers. And that will depend on the complexity of the problem that we're trying to solve. Okay, so have this in your mind. And here you can see um, an example of um, of interpretability. So before we mentioned that uh, deep learning models are considered as black box approaches because we cannot um, <clears throat> be very confident on how they have reached to a specific decision. Um, so yeah, I mean, to be honest, you will find different people um, agreeing or disagreeing with this type of, uh, of, of plots because you know, machine learning 
by definition, it's not a very transparent approach because it's, you know, especially if you have high dimensional data, so you can only go, you know, as far um, to um, understanding how a decision has been has been made, right? But, you know, as a, as a rule of thumb, you, you can think of deep learning to, uh, as being one of the most uh, accurate, most um, highly performing models, but less interpretable compared to other ones. Um, examples of which you, you can see uh, in this plot, like decision trees, KNS, Nebus, and, and so on. So when when it comes to different type of uh, different types of deep learning models, there are some uh, more established ones, let's say a bit more popular ones, um, like the convolutional neural networks, which have been maybe uh, the ones that are found more routinely in uh, in deployed models or, or in practice. For instance, your mobile phone most likely when you take a picture of yourself, you see that you know there's something happening in the background. Uh, processing the image that you are getting sometimes, right? Some filters, some smoothing. All of these in the past, they used to be based on uh, image processing algorithms, right? But in the, in the last five, six years or so, uh, all of these are based on AI. So these are practically based on deep learning models. So next time that you take a picture of yourself or, or a portrait and you will read that, you know, my, my mobile phone has some software based processing uh, procedures, these are based on, on deep learning models, right? And convolutional neural networks has been one of the most um, successful ones. So you can see here that um, we have an input and image. So recall what we discussed before, we have images as input. So this is the first thing that we um, kind of importing to um, a deep learning model. So the difference between what we saw before in the example with the different hidden layers to uh, deep learning model like this one is that we have this part of the model, right? So before what we saw was this part, right? Before we had three, we had two, now we have three. So this part here, which is the convolutional part, uh, it has a series of different filters. You can think of it as filters, which are called convolutional layers, that they are much more powerful in going through different parts of the image like that. So if you had a filter, this is what it will be doing, what I'm doing myself now. So take different patches of the image, right? And then try to extract information from each of these patches so that then you understand, you know what? This part of the image shows, let's say, the calories and I'm trying to kind of have an automated system that uh, for instance, detects at which part of, of the food packaging label you can find the calories, right? So that is uh, an example of, of a deep learning application. So when we have the input, what happens in this part of the network is try to kind of extract um, different features at different levels of abstraction. As we mentioned before, with my face as an example, we have curves, lines, but then, you know, I hope that my face is not just lines and curves, right? I have face. So I have eyes, I have nose. So then, then you expect the algorithm to learn that, you know, me, if you want to, to detect me in a crowd, you have to understand that this is my face. I have a, a beard, whatever that is, right? So you want to learn as much information as you can for me and then for others that you want to kind of uh, differentiate from myself. So everything about extracting this type of information happens in that part, right? So then when we move onto that part, then all of these pieces come together. So then you say, you know what, I have extracted features, so now we have to put everything together and say, you know what, this uh, combination of features corresponds to this person here, or this combination corresponds to another person. So here is the, let's say, the pattern recognition uh, process, right? And here we have the output, similar to before. Here it would be, for instance, if we have uh, two outputs, let's say one can be myself, and that can be my my daughter, right? So that is the output that you can have, for instance, uh, in, in reality, if you have uh, a face recognition system, right? Okay, so at the bottom, you see another one quite popular approach, uh, which is an unsupervised approach. So convolutional neural networks are supervised. And why they are supervised? Remember what we said before? 
we need labels. So in this case, we have labels. We know that, for instance, um, this image corresponds to a food package and label, right? Whereas autoreporters belong to the family of unsupervised approaches, right? Because we don't have layers. That's why um, they are usually kind of applicable more to problems whereby I don't want to classify something, so I don't want to detect something. I just want to extract information and then use this extracted information for whatever other things I want to do. So, for instance, you could even combine autoencoders with uh, convolutional neural networks, so you have this type of relationship. Um, so, as you can see here, the input is the same like the one above, so you can have images. And then as you move, you see, as you move towards different layers, then we kind of shrink the space. So when we arrive here, this space is smaller than the original one. And then when we carry on moving, as you see in this part, we go back to the same dimension that we had originally. So what happens here is that we hope that in, in this part of the network, we have compressed the space in a way where we capture all the important information of the input space, right? So imagine, for instance, the JPEG image format that you have all of you familiar with, right? This is a compressed file. So if you have the raw image, it might be 50 megabytes. And when you have a JPEG, it could be two megabytes. But you as a human and myself, I cannot see a difference. So the algorithm has managed from a 50 megabyte space to go down to two megabytes without losing, um, you know, extensive information, right? Of course, uh, the quality might be affected, but not to a level that you as a human, if you want to, to, to see that in your mobile device or in, the, in your PC, you will see a difference, right? So what happens here is we compress the space and then how successful that approach is depends on how well then you can go and reconstruct that. So actually from the point that we are here, then again, we are moving towards this part. So the closer this part is to the original input, the better the process is. So we want to lose as much information as possible and still have a much smaller space here when we compress the uh, kind of learning process, right? Another very famous um, type of neural network, which all of you have seen, definitely, is generative adversarial networks. So you, you will definitely have seen that in applications of uh, generating fake images of celebrities or uh, fake art. So all of this is based on this type of, of neural network, right? So of course, it's a complex type of model, but in a, in a simplistic way, we can say that you have two parallel models, okay? So one model uh, is, let's say, exactly the same like the one we saw before. So we have a convolutional neural network that learns from real data, right? Nothing changes, the same exact process. But at the same time, um, I have a second model that works in parallel with the first one where they play a game. So think of it as a game. So they try to compete with each other, right? So the model that learns from the data is called discriminator, right? So that model gets real data. The other model, which is the generator, tries to generate fake images that they look as closely to the original ones, so to the um, real ones, as possible. And that happens, you know what? Let's try to fool you. So then um, the generator tries to fool the discriminator. And then, you know, they play this game constantly until you arrive to a point where generator, through multiple iterations, has managed to learn very well how things work so that it can fool the discriminator. So you arrive to a point where the images like this one, right, that is generated by the generator are very similar to the real images. So then when the discriminator tries to see, you know, is this a real one or a fake one? So it arrives to a point where the generator has become so good and successful that the fake one is very closely, uh, you know, related to the real ones. That's why you get, for instance, fake celebrities. So you see a face that you can say, yeah, I don't know, it could be a celebrity somewhere um, that looks like that, right? Because it looks realistic in our eyes, right? So that is the 
generative adversarial network uh, type of model. And then we have uh, another type of model which is called recurrent neural networks, which is a, a type of model that is used when we have time series. So in this case, we are having, let's say, sensor data. So in sensor data, we might be getting, let's say, data at multiple in inputs, right? So we have T, in this case, is time. So we have, let's say, four time steps. And then from each time step, we are, you know, learning. So we have one, two, three, four, right? So, so in this case, each of these units that we have created here tries to learn something from its timestamp. And then having this temporal component, we are able from different timestamps to extract information so that then we say, you know what, in the last day or so that I have data for, um, we can say that, you know, the weather was good. So an example could be, for instance, you know, from the previous day's uh, data temperatures that we get every minute, uh, classify how the weather has been. I don't know, I haven't, I haven't watched BBC News, I haven't have an idea about the weather. So from the data of yesterday, please classify whether that is, um, you know, whether the weather has been good or, or bad. So you, you, you exploit all the temporal information we have available to detect something. And again, let's go back to what we said before. In this context, it can both be a, a regression problem or a classification problem, right? And a bit more recent, type of, of networks, which is part of my uh, kind of immediate research are capsule neural networks. So that is quite, uh, you know, a revolutionary way of thinking about uh, deep learning. So fundamentally, the same concepts that we've discussed so far are valid for this type of, of networks. Uh, so you can, whatever we discussed about convolutional neural network uh, can be applied to, to this type of models. But the difference between CNNs convolutional neural networks and capsule networks is the fact that capsule networks are much more um, aware of the um, spatial information within an image. So for instance, this is a very famous problem which is called a Picasso problem, where we have you know, an eye here, a mouth, nose, another eye. So a CNN, because it doesn't have very well defined spatial information within the image, it might still detect this image as being face, right? But me and you, you understand that, okay, yeah, if you think of it in, in an abstract way, you can say, yeah, that is a phase. Mm, depends on how you, you define a phase. Hopefully there's no one looking like that in, in practice. But you would say, no, okay, yeah, that, that seems to be a fake uh, phase, right? So this is not real. Maybe this is art. So, but the CNN model can tell you, no, yeah, but this is a phase. So it can, you know, it's not correct in that context. Whereas capsule networks um, are much more aware of that process because they learn how the spatial distribution of important characteristics uh, actually is. In this context, you, know, you say, for instance, to be a phase, you have to have, you know, the eyes in this location and this coordination. You have to have the eyebrows here and the nose here and the mouth here. So if, if the mouth goes here, then it's, it's on the face. Okay, so that is a new type of model that has emerged in the last couple of years that, uh, you know, we are using to uh, make more robust systems, right? Of course, they have the problems, you know, uh, that is something we discussed extensively in, in our program here. So if, uh, you know, uh, students in uh, courses that we have, for instance, uh, machine learning, applied AI and the data mining, we go in depth about these type of problems and, and we kind of go to the mathematics of, of uh, for instance, how you can develop such models from scratch and understand, you know, the concepts behind uh, why capsule networks are different to CNNs, right? So now we've seen um, some basics about deep learning. So I'm going to show you a couple of uh, examples that we have applied deep learning um, in this context. And I'm very proud of, of the first one, um, which is a COVID-19 detection from chest X-ray images, because that was an MSc AI student project that uh, it was achieved just in three months. So that was that was a project that uh, you know. Uh, the students started last May when um, students at the MSc programs uh, start the uh, uh, AI project. So the idea was that we use uh, medical images that we um, can find available. Uh, you know, in this context, they are available because of the COVID-19 case. So, you know, I'm not sure how aware you are about that, but because of this pandemic uh, and to be able to develop systems that you can actually 
help with the pandemic. Uh, most of the clinical data have been made uh, available to the research community, which doesn't usually happen in the medical domain because it's a very kind of um, regulated uh, concept where to get clinical data, you have to get, you know, um, ethical approvals and, and so on. But in this context for the COVID-19, things were a bit simplified. So for this project, we had um, images like these ones, which are X-ray images that show the chest. And within each of these images, um, for instance, uh, one of them is normal. So it means that you have no pathology. The other one has COVID-19. And the other one has um, other type of pneumonia, right? So the uh, the objective of this uh, study has been to develop a system. The system is here, right? So it's based on deep learning to be able to learn corresponding features from all of these different classes. So in, in this case, we have a three class problem so that we are able then to um, kind of detect whether we have you know COVID-19 or other type of pneumonia or nothing no pathology at all and of course we you know because we touched upon before the robustness of machine learning approaches uh, it's quite common sometimes uh, when we have small amounts of data to be learning some characteristics of the image that sometimes do not correspond to reality, right? So in this case, for instance, uh, to give you a quick example, if we have uh, three different types of images that we see um, here, it might be that these images come from different hospitals, right? So different hospitals might employ different uh, protocols. So sometimes when we develop algorithms, when we have few data, it could be that the algorithm, uh, you know, learns um, variables or characteristics of the images that do not correspond to the actual problem. So in this case, the problem is to detect COVID-19. So it, they might be learning, uh, you know, uh, the image protocol. So the images might be different just because they were captured from a different device, right? So to test our robustness in our concept, what we did was this part here. So we created the patch, or a black part totally, so that we can obscure the image and then we try to use the same technique to say you know what okay now with the chest obscure that doesn't appear in the in your image can you still detect COVID-19 right so and um, then we saw that yeah our method is uh, robust when we have cases whereby you know we have a uh, few data from different type of, of uh, hospitals and we compared our studies with um, um, other types of um, of proposed studies and the student did a great uh, work over the summer and we managed to even you know write a paper uh, which is under review currently in, in, in a journal so that is an MSCAI output which is, is, is great uh, especially if you think that that was achieved within you know in, in a three-month period right another example that is quite uh, related to my own as well research activity is detecting anomalies in nuclear reactors so as you know nuclear reactors uh, you know, in different countries and in the UK is one of the main sources of producing uh, energy. But of course, reactors, um, you know, operate at different conditions. So, you know, some of them, they are very old now and there are different events that happen in the reactor uh, that are not ideal. So in this case, we would like to create a system that from the operational data of the nuclear reactor, we are able to say, you know what, I detect that there is an abnormal event happening at the, at the moment. Maybe you have to act upon that. Maybe, you know, have a, uh, um, an engineer have a look at that to see if that is normal or not. So that is a very important problem because as you can imagine, you know, we wouldn't like to have uh, another disaster, you know. So you would like to have as much uh, help to identify possible problems within reactors. So a machine learning system and uh, an expert, a nuclear physicist in that context, working both uh, in, in synergy, and that is very important in, in that context. So then we develop a system, and this is a system that, that you see here that combines uh, the two different type of deep learning models. So in this case here, I'm sure now after this lecture, you will quickly identify that this is um, a recurrent neural network, RNN, specifically LSTM. LSTM is a type 
of Recalino network. And then we have also um, a second type, which is the CNN, which is the convolutional neural network. So then we combine information that we extract from both of these type of networks to uh, first here detect different types of anomalies. Let's say we have two different types of anomalies and here we say yes. So this is one type and this is another type. And then because as you know, and probably you, you've seen somewhere that a nuclear reactor has a structure, so it's like a 3D structure. You can easily say that, you know, if you have a 3D structure, then we have uh, three dimensions, right? So X, Y, and Z, for instance. So in this case, then we go here and I, J, K in this case are the coordinates and we say, you know what, you uh, detected that there's an anomaly happening, you know, that is called perturbation one, right? And then you say, okay, we know that, but at which part of the reactor does this happen? So then you go on to that stage here to say, you know what, that happens at this location, at the IJK location where we have a sensor. So tell your engineer to kind of focus on that area because this is where I'm getting something from, right? So in this case, this is a very good example that we combine both a classification, which is the first part, and a regression component, which is the second part. So the classification gives you a binary output, so perturbation one and perturbation two, whereas the, the regression part, it gives you a location. So it gives you a number to say, you know what, don't look everywhere, look at this location because I know that this is where everything uh, originated from, right? So you are becoming much more precise and that's very important. So bottom line, what we also did was that we tried to complicate our lives. So in this case, we, uh, you know, obscure the data. So we removed sensors, we added noise in the data, and the purpose of, of all of that was so that we say, you know what, can we maybe replicate more uh, what would happen in a real life scenario? So we try to kind of create different scenarios. So then we made the problem a bit more difficult. So then when we try to produce results, we try to kind of evaluate different type of scenarios, right? So, um, so what this problem, uh, Kind of has a, as a specific attribute is that it's a very high impact, uh, you know, real life problem. Which means that if you make a mistake, there is, you know, a massive impact that can happen or an event that might happen that, you know, can create a massive disruption to, to, to the uh, very large part of, of, of the society, right? So again, that is a message that I want to pass across uh, in, in today's lecture in a sense that. Uh, when we build real life AI or machine learning or deep learning applications, it's very important to understand the problem before we go on to designing a model. We have to understand what are the implications, what are the assumptions, what are the requirements. That's why we, we work very closely with stakeholders, with industry partners. Uh, and our MSc students do the same. So they go on to placements, they go on to uh, you know, different companies to work after graduating. So that's a very important aspect that we uh, focus a lot in this uh, MSc program uh, as well, right? So as we uh, wrapping up things, I would say that, you know, of course, deep learning is not the, you know, uh, the solution for everything. Uh, there are some open problems in reality. Some of them correspond to scalability and computational, computational demands. Uh, as I said before, to train a deep learning model, you need resources which are expensive sometimes or not available. So that is, you know, a caveat when it comes to working with deep learning models. Of course, uh, computing scientists are not uh, you know, we're not working in isolation, closed in our, in our space and just not communicating with anyone else. So in real life, when you are uh, deploying models in real life, you know, through uh, different, you know, processes that, that you are employing, you have to collaborate with others. Others could be clinicians, you know, medical practitioners, physicists, engineers, managers, you know, you have to, to have this skill of being able to collaborate with others. And this MSCI program covers that aspect quite extensively um, as well. Uh, other problems that we saw before with a black box example is transparency and uh, you know explainability. Okay, you told me that there is a perturbation happening in, in the nuclear reactor. Can you explain to me how did you come up with this conclusion? As humans, we're a bit more able to reason. You know, I saw this, I saw that. But the machine learning models sometimes, you know, they are very good in, in creating these abstractions. But because it's a, at a high dimensional space, it's very hard to go and see. Okay, where did that happen from? So that is one of the limitations that, that we have. But of course, it comes to the to, um, you know, other benefit of higher performance. 
you know, technical challenges is always something that uh, we encounter pretty much in everywhere in computing science. So we have bugs in our algorithms. We, uh, you know, we have to establish some sort of theoretical underpinning, you know, new knowledge, novelty, so that we improve performance and applications. All of these things come quite handy. And of course, in this, uh, you know, in our program, I would say that um, we are not only focusing on the theory, of course, that is a very important part, but we also, in different assignments, in different competitions that, that we are organizing, we are uh, employing real life applications, right? So we are actually incorporating this real life component onto our program so that we say, you know what, you learn the theory, but also you understand in which context we can apply the theory to, right? So that's very important. And of course, speaking from a personal experience, uh, one of the main problems that we have when we are, you know, uh, delving into a new research project is data availability. So we would like to have millions of, of data points, but in reality, that is not the case always. So a big part of deep learning research concerns the development of techniques that they can learn for few examples. So we have, let's say, uh, very few examples of a specific class and you want to develop algorithms that you can you know, learn from just very few amounts of data. And that's called one sort learning of few sort learning. And that is one very important aspect that we cover as well in this uh, program. So I guess that is it for, from me. So um, if you have any questions, I think maybe I've seen some questions posted uh, but if you have more, just, just you know, carry on uh, posting them and, and I will be happy to answer now. Or if you want to contact me, uh, you know, I saw my details previously, please feel free to contact me whenever you want, if you want to have one-to-one -one discussion. So I would go on to the first question, which is, do you need experience in deep learning to study at the university? No, you don't need experience in deep learning to study at, at the university, especially at our MSAI program. Deep learning knowledge is something that is covered as part of our curriculum. So we have different courses. One uh, that I'm teaching myself is called data mining, where we actually go onto details about all of these uh, models that we discussed today, like CNNs, capsule networks, the Calenio network. So, so you don't need knowledge in deep learning to join our program. We cover that as part of our curriculum. Uh, what programs on offer include deep learning and machine learning? Uh, I think the only problem, the, the only program uh, within our university that covers both aspects is is the MSc on AI program that we deliver um, as part of our uh, offer. Uh, so we have the MSc AI program uh, which sits within the Department of Computing Science. I am directing this program, and, and that program is a highly specialized one that we are trying to to cover all the state of the art concepts at the moment on, on AI, on machine learning and on deep learning. Uh, and of course, that is a program that is constantly enhanced in a sense that, you know, new theory comes out uh, or we develop new theory because we, all of us, we are research active staff. So I am myself a research active uh, uh, staff. I produce novel research and I incorporate my research onto the program. That's why, uh, you know, we, we are offering a very highly uh, specialized uh, program because we are actually constantly improving the program when we have you know new research new application areas like you know uh, the nuclear reactors that so previously for instance myself sometimes uh, a different context i even introduce students to this kind of project so students have the opportunity uh, to get actually involved in, in research projects that we are running uh, via, for instance, the uh, MSCI project that they do over summer or even throughout the studies. So they contact us, say, you know, I'm interested in this concept. Is there anything that I can help with or contribute to? So we encourage this from students. And of course, many students go on to do uh, a placement as part of the uh, MSCI project. And that's something that we encourage them. And, and we have uh, local links with uh, industry and also we have very close collaboration with the Data Lab, which is an organization in Scotland that uh, also funds uh, MSCI programs, but also accommodates different placement opportunities for uh, graduates as part of that. So we have many opportunities for students, not only to engage with us throughout the studies, but also, you know, put the, the skills in practice and uh, work as intern or even, you know, uh, as graduates to different local industries within Aberdeen or even within Scotland. So we try to, to, to accommodate that and, and encourage that, right? 
Um, so yeah, that is it from me. I'm not sure if we have any more questions um, in that context. So I think we, we covered uh, quite a few aspects of, of our program. So if I can finish uh, with some you know, further lines about our program, I would say that uh, what University of Berlin does very well is that we are combining, as I said, very novel theoretical concepts into our programs and also real life applications. So we believe that you know to create a successful pipeline uh, that is delivered as an MSCI program, it's very important to focus both on building upon uh, some very solid uh, theoretical concepts, because otherwise how can you understand what, what you are doing, but also put everything into context and say, you know what, we are learning this theory because real life applications demand some type of concept. So we hope and we know that our graduates, that for instance, uh, an MSCI uh, student that I supervised myself this year, she now went on to work uh, at CERN, which is the um, facility in, in, uh, in, in the borders of Switzerland and France that they are doing um, physics experiments, right? So we have other students that they went on to carry on working on the company that they did the placement at. They were good and the company kept them. So there are many opportunities and I think our program offers uh, these foundations that then you can go on to do a PhD in, 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 at the University of Aberdeen or to work in, uh, in industry or anywhere else that require AI skills. So that, that is how I would like to finish uh, today's lecture. So unless you have uh, any other questions that, that you want to post, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, attending today and, and for watching this, this lecture. I hope you, you got some, some useful information out of that and I'm really looking forward to uh, actually uh, meeting some of you that you decide to, to join our program uh, soon. Bye-bye.